This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you are very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And as I promised, I think a few videos ago now, today we are going to take a look at the failed marriage negotiations that occurred between the future King Edward VI of England and Mary, Queen of Scots. The aftermath of this broken betrothal came to be known as the rough wooing. But before we jump into today's topic, I do want to say an absolutely massive thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. And I'm particularly grateful because this partnership is, it seems, finally just the kick in the backside that I need to get to work on building and indeed launching my very own website. I have found that Squarespace has made this whole process really straightforward because when you are using Squarespace, you get to make use of their Fluid Engine website design system. So through this, I started out with one of the website templates that Squarespace suggested, and they suggested this based upon the categories that I selected as being the best fit for the kind of work that I do. These templates, though, are super flexible and customizable. Even better, you can even customize how the website looks across various devices. As soon as my website is all ready and launched, I will of course be letting you all know so that you can go and check it out. So do watch this space for that. And in the meantime, you can go over and build your own website. If you go to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you are ready to launch, just go to squarespace.com forward slash reading the past to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. And now let's go and take a look at those tense Tudor marriage negotiations. Today we are going to be focusing on a moment of conflict that occurred between England and Scotland during the 16th century. But it's important to remember that this particular conflict did not erupt out of nowhere. The enmity between these two nations has really long roots, with frequent border skirmishes and occasional battlefield combat being very much the order of the day across history. Evidence, I think, of the longevity of this combative relationship between the, quote, old enemies is even written into the tomb of King Edward I. This king, who died on the 7th of July 1307, is memorialised on his tomb in Latin as, quote, Edward I, Hammer of the Scots, Keep Troth. This inscription, now faded, is not, however, contemporaneous to his burial. Indeed, the team from Westminster Abbey, where this particular tomb is located, explain that the inscription was, quote, not painted on it until the 16th century. Even the heraldic national animals of these two countries were frequently positioned as being the traditional enemies of one another. In this, I am referring to the Lion of England, which was adopted by that nation by at least the 12th century, and also to the Unicorn of Scotland, adopted during the 15th century. Elise Walters is responsible for researching the origins of this perception of there being a hatred between these two beasts, and reportedly it can be traced back all the way to the ancient Babylonians in the year 3500 BCE. In 1295, Scotland's John Balliol worked with Philip IV of France on the creation of an alliance between their nations. This alliance would come to be known as the, quote, Old Alliance. A principal aim of this alliance was to provide mutual support and protection between these nations in the face of a perceived territorial expansion that was, at least as far as they could see, the key desire of King Edward I's England. But thus, England found herself sandwiched between two nations that had allied themselves to each other because of a shared distrust, even an enmity, 
for England, which surely I think we can understand would have felt a little bit threatening, to say the very least. However, it wasn't always about threat and the risk of war, because if we fast forward to the 16th century, there is at least a glimmer of hope. On the 31st of October 1502, King Henry VII of England and King James IV of Scots ratified a treaty of perpetual peace between their two nations. As part of this treaty, the negotiations for which had begun as far back as 1496, it was agreed that Henry VII's eldest daughter, Margaret, would travel to Scotland to become the wife and queen of King James IV. Now, I do have a video on Margaret Tudor that I will be leaving linked. This couple's formal wedding would take place in the chapel of Holyrood House on the 8th of August, 1503. Margaret and James would have one surviving child, a son, who was also named James. He was born on the 11th of April, 1512. In the May of the following year, 1513, Margaret's brother, King Henry VIII, who had been King of England since the death of their father in 1509, invaded France. Margaret's husband, in turn, and despite her pleas to the contrary, attacked England. James IV was killed at the Battle of Flodden on the 9th of September, 1513. Margaret Tudor now became the regent for her infant son, who, through the death of his father, had become King James V. Margaret would be forced from this position following her marriage to Archibald Douglas, the 6th Earl of Angus. In 1534, Margaret's son, who was by this point a grown man and ruling in his own right, ratified another treaty of perpetual peace with England, with his uncle, King Henry VIII. However, this treaty, much like the one that came before it, seemingly did very little to either challenge or indeed supersede the earlier alliance that Scotland continued to enjoy with France. And so, when it was time for King James V to go in search of a bride, it would be to France that he would turn, rather than to England. Now, of course, I do recognise that if we are thinking about the mid to late 1530s, as we are in this case, Henry VIII did have precious little to offer in regard of royal brides for his nephew. I mean, after all, if we think about the end of 1536, by that point, Henry's daughters, the ones both by Catherine Aragon and by Anne Boleyn, were being viewed as legitimate. This, in turn, naturally made them a less appealing commodity when it came to the royal marriage market. Nevertheless, I am sure that if Henry had been consulted on the matter, he certainly would have sought to discourage his nephew from making a French match, just as, I'm assuming, he would probably have discouraged a Habsburg match too at this point. Complicating matters further was the fact that James V was also unwilling to follow his uncle Henry's example and make a break from the Holy See of Rome. He wished to continue in his allegiance to the Pope. In 1537, James V married Madeleine of France, who was the daughter of King Francis I. Madeleine was not a well woman, and so James was widowed in the very same year of his marriage. James V was turned back to France when he was seeking to remarry as well. He married Mary of Guise in 1538. By the August of 1542, so some four years after James's marriage to Mary of Guise, relations between England and Scotland had broken down to such an extent that the Anglo-Scottish Wars were reignited. On November the 24th, 1542, the Scottish forces were routed at the Battle of Solway Moss. A few weeks later, James V and Mary of Guise's only surviving child, who was also called Mary, was born on the 8th of December, 1542. By the point of Mary's birth, James V was already dangerously ill. Indeed, he would die just six days later, on December the 14th, 1542. James V's 
six-day-old daughter thus became Mary, Queen of Scots. Scotland and England opened peace negotiations, and in these negotiations, little Mary could play an integral part. Because as part of this proposed peace treaty, which came to be known as the Treaty of Greenwich, it was agreed that Mary, Queen of Scots, would marry King Henry VIII's son, Prince Edward, who would later go on to become King Edward VI. And it was, of course, hoped that this marriage would be one that would produce children, in particular sons. The eldest of these sons would be heir to both Scotland and England, and so the crowns would be united. Ideally, it was thought, the nations would follow. The Treaty of Greenwich was signed on the 1st of July, 1543. However, in the December of that same year, 1543, the Scottish Parliament chose to reject the treaty. There was, among their number, it seemed, those who had a preference to continue to focus on France and on the alliance that they already had there. This preference was, I'd imagine, no doubt supported and even furthered by Mary of Guise, who was, of course, the French mother and then later the regent on behalf of her daughter, Mary, Queen of Scots. King Henry VIII's response to the rejection of this treaty was to declare war on Scotland within a matter of days. Now, the aim of this declaration of war was certainly retaliation, but also it was seemingly hoped that if the right amount of pressure could be applied, then maybe, just maybe, the terms of the Treaty of Greenwich might become more attractive to those in Scotland that had originally rejected them. In May 1544, little Prince Edward's maternal uncle, Edward Seymour, who was then Earl of Hertford, led an army that was sent to attack Scotland. They reportedly set fire to much of Edinburgh, and this army also burnt towns and villages as they made their way back overland towards England. And in the meantime, while all this burning and spoiling was going on, the English were also looting. English ships, filled with loot, were getting ready to sail out of the port of Leith. Subsequently, English troops would continue to make regular violent incursions in the Scottish borderlands and lowlands. This was until their defeat at the Battle of Ancrum Moor. At this battle, which took place on the 27th of February 1545, it has been estimated that despite the Scottish forces having begun the day being hugely outnumbered by the English, that by the end of it, the Scottish losses were negligible. While it is said that around 800 English troops had been killed and 1,000 had been taken prisoner. Then there was a pause in the hostilities, the continuation of which became part of the Treaty of Ard. This treaty was agreed between Henry VIII of England and Francis I of France, and it was a treaty made as a result of the English invasion of France. As part of this treaty, Henry promised that he would not attack Scotland without provocation. The so-called rough wooing wasn't over, though. It would ramp up again following the death of King Henry VIII and the accession of his son as King Edward VI. Edward's government were keen promoters of the cause of the English Reformation and its doctrines, and they wanted to see these things be extended up into Scotland. England also returned to its aggressive pursuit of Mary Queen of Scots as a bride for King Edward VI. Violence soon broke out. Scottish forces would suffer a massive defeat at the Battle of Pinky Clare on September the 10th, 1547. Estimates with regard to the exact number of casualties do vary. They are hotly debated, but what is agreed is that many thousands of people died on the Scottish side. And I am sure at this point, the English troops, the English government thought, well, we've got Scotland where we want them, they are going to agree to the treaty and we are going to have a bride for Edward in Mary, Queen of Scots. However, rather than come to the terms that were being put forward by the English, 
The Scottish Government made alternate arrangements, namely, they made plans to get Mary Queen of Scots out of the country and thus away from English claims to her hand in marriage. Mary Queen of Scots would land in France on the 13th of August 1548. Skirmishes, attacks and even sieges would rumble on as little by little the English supplies dwindled down and disappeared. Eventually, English forces would abandon their remaining positions towards the end of 1549. Peace between England and Scotland would finally be declared as part of another Anglo-French treaty. This was the Peace of Boulogne of 1550. So the way I see it, for eight years, this so-called rough wooing cost many people their lives and achieved little to nothing. Now, of course, I do recognise that the Scottish Kirk would ultimately, and in the not too distant future from this point, take up the cause and principles of reformed religion. However, I don't think that English aggression can take any credit for this particular shift. So what do you think of the so-called rough wooing, of its background and indeed of its aftermath? As always, I am really looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video, and I would also love it if you could pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comment section too, and that is because the more engagement a video gets, the more YouTube recognises people are enjoying it, and thus they share it out, which will help us to grow this community. As we've been talking about England versus Scotland, you can pick a side with your emoji. You can have lions for England and unicorns for Scotland. You can let me know in the comments which your favourite is. If you don't want to pick a side, how about we do something royal, queens and kings, or something engagement-y, as this was a failed betrothal. I'm looking forward to seeing which you will choose. You can also find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all of the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do consider following me over on some or all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, why not share it with your friends? In fact, if you like my channel, do let some pals know about it. That way you can chat to them about history in real life as well as chatting with all of us on here. You can let me know that you like this particular video by hitting the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to the channel. And if you think you are subscribed, have a little check now. Make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you against your will. And while you are there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please do hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that will appear. And that will mean Allegedly, YouTube claims that they will tell you when I have next uploaded and indeed when I'm next planning to go live. And I know you aren't going to want to miss that. So make sure that bell is hit. I hope that you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye for now.